Excellent. All right, it's... Welcome back, everybody, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Alexei Block Gorman, who will give us the, give the uh, final talk for this morning on Vichy Automata and fractals on the rails. Alexei, please. Thank you, Margaret, and uh, thanks to to all of the organizers um, for organizing this workshop. Um, I'm really enjoying the talks and uh, and my talk today. Um, which we'll talk about, as Margaret said, um, definability and dimension in expressions, uh, expansions of the real ordered additive group by our regular subsets. Um, this talk will will build a bit more on what what the talks were about yesterday, Chris and Ihan and Philip's talk, um, and relate to that more so than than sort of the trans series um, type of talk that we've that we've seen today mostly. Okay. So I first wanted to make sure, even if, you know, hopefully many of you have seen this, uh, the automaton construction at some point, I wanted to give the formal definitions that we're all on the same page. So an automaton is a special five tuple, um, which we write as Q, sigma, delta, Q0, and F, such that Q is the set of states. Um, so I have this automaton diagram that I'm hoping will guide your intuition about what an automaton is. Um, throughout the talk, I'll, I'll sort of cavalierly identify automata with the automaton diagram, um, but hopefully in this definition, it'll become clear how to de decipher the automaton from the diagram and vice versa. Um, so Q is the set of states. So for example, in the, the automaton I have a diagram of, it would be Q0 and Q1 are the elements. Sigma is a finite alphabet. Uh, looking at a diagram, you can't tell a priori, but you know at least a subset uh, of the, the alphabet. Um, and so here in, in this diagram, we can see the alphabet is zero and one. Delta is the transition function. It goes from Q cross sigma to Q. Rather, it's a partial function in general, like it is in this diagram. So for each state and, uh, and letter or symbol in your alphabet, delta tells you what state to go to or it doesn't uh, give an output. So it might just be a partial function and not not have an output for a given state and, and symbol. Q0 is the initial state. So in the diagram, I indicate this with an arrow labeled start that points at the initial state. Um, and I'll also sort of tellingly call it Q0. Um, and F is the set of except states, also called final states, hence F. Um, and in the literature, it's often denoted with a double circle but uh, in my slides, I'll use bold circles. So in the diagram above, Q1 is encircled with a bold circle, and that's to uh, show that it's a, an accept state. Right, so for a finite alphabet sigma, we'll let sigma star denote all same, uh, strings that sigma generates. And we'll call L a subset of sigma star a language. We'll say that an automaton A recognizes L if for every string in sigma star, running A on input W ends in an accept state precisely when W is in L. Um, so for, for every W that's not in L, it's uh, not, it doesn't terminate in an accept state. Right, so as an example, this is the automaton diagram that I had on the previous slide. And we can see it just by looking at the automaton diagram that if a word does not contain a one, it is not accepted, right? And if it does contain a one, it does get accepted. Um, but but slightly more nuanced, right? If it if it has some number of zeros and then a one and then some number of zeros, it'll get accepted. But notice that if it has a zero, some number of zeros, a one, and then another one, there's no arrow. And so the absence of an arrow corresponding to a one means that it's, it goes to an implicit dead state or is rejected. So actually the language that this automaton diagram accepts is those that contain exactly one one. So we can write L as zero star one zero star, uh, meaning I'm using star as cleaning star. So all strings generated by the alphabet zero. Or we can write this as the set of strings of the form zero to the n, one, zero to the n, where n and m are natural numbers. 
Okay, so that's that's basically what uh, automata are and uh, how we think about languages, languages that automata recognize. So the the collection of languages that that are related to automata are regular languages. Regular languages, the subsets of sigma star recognized by some automaton, are closed under many of our favorite operations. So complementation, uh, union and intersection, concatenation, Kleene star. So that's the the asterisk I've been using. And indeed, the class of regular expressions, um, these are sort of how we write regular languages, um, you know, by hand when we don't want to draw the automaton diagram of the automaton that witnesses that the language is regular. So the class of regular expressions, I give an example there, generated from the alphabet sigma via union, concatenation, and Kleene star is equivalent to the class of regular languages. Right. So what does this have to do with model theory? Um, well, there have been some very interesting connections and I'm going to talk about a few. So um, in a paper of Rahim Musa and Tom, Scan Tom Scanlon, um, they define this uh, construction called F sets, which they use to unify the isotrivial case of the mortal lang theorem in characteristic P, which was sort of treated as an exceptional case by Hrushovsky, like he, he sort of dealt with the isotrivial case separately in characteristic P from the non-isotrivial cases. And then Rahim and Tom sort of found a, a construction that allowed them to unify the argument across the isotrivial and non-isotrivial cases. Um, I'll give a reference for that at the end. And then in a subsequent paper, Jason Bell and Rahim Musa show that these, these so-called F sets are recognized by finite automata in a particular sense. And I'm so sorry, I just realized I should have said at the very beginning, uh, the work that I'm speaking about today is joint work with Jason Bell. Um, so uh, yes, I retroactively apologize to Jason. Right, so, so what do Jason and, and Raheem do? So to characterize what these F sets look like in terms of automata, they introduce a notion of sparseness for automata specifically. Um, now, I, 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 yeah, I won't get into this quite yet, but uh, sparseness is is sort of the the right word in the sense that that um, it coincides in in a certain sense with like sparseness as as uh, used or defined by by Friedman and Miller. Um, okay, but so sparseness for finite automata say. Or, or sorry, for, for um, languages in, in sigma star, again, sigma finite alphabet, we say a language uh, in sigma star is sparse if the number of words in L of length at most n grows at most polynomially in n. Right. So, so sort of a straightforward like growth of prefixes kind of, well, not prefixes, growth, growth of um, fixed length or lower words. So now I'm going to pivot to Bucci automata because um, although finite automata are interesting and, and sort of the applications of finite automata to model theory are interesting, they aren't um, as much related to tame geometry as uh, a generalization, which is Bucci automata. Um, which sort of fits into this tame geometry framework that, that Philip mentioned in his talk yesterday uh, in a very compelling way. If there's time, I'll talk about that at the end. Right, so Bucci automata differ from traditional automata in that they accept infinite length strings rather than finite length. So we say uh, that the automaton accepts a, a string if it enters some accept state infinitely often, right? Pigeonhole principle says there are finitely many states, there's some accept state that it will uh, enter infinitely often, right? Um, if, it, if it enters, you know, accept states generally, the set of accept states infinitely often. Okay. Right, and so now as an example, I have an automaton diagram here, states Q0 and Q1, this time Q0 is the accept state. 
the alphabet implicitly is uh, zero, one, and two, uh, those three symbols. And so how do we think of this automaton um, as maybe running on, on infinite strings or uh, sort of uh, in, a more, in a more practical setting? Here's how we think of, of the automaton as running on, on uh, sort of elements of the zero one interval within the reals. So we think of the input strings for this automaton as the ternary representations for points in the, the real zero one interval. So uh, right, if, if X can be written as D1 times a third plus D2 times a ninth, and so on with you know digits d1, d2, etc. in the the alphabet zero one two, then we we sort of associate x with the input d1, d2, and so on um, that we that we can feed into this automaton, right? And so say that a subset of the zero one interval is R regular. If there is a Bucci automaton that accepts an input, precisely if the input is a base R expansion of some, some X, little X and big X. Um, and I guess there, you know, you might be thinking, well, there's, there's sometimes multiple representations, um, but it's, it's a non-trivial fact and a useful one that, that we can find uh, an equivalent automaton, which uh, accepts or does not accept every representation of, of any given element of uh, an R regular subset of, of zero one. Um, yeah. So, right, so this particular automaton I'm, I'm bringing up for a reason. So what does this Bucci automaton recognize? So we can see by examination that the strings it recognizes are those that only have zeros and twos in their ternary representations. As soon as a one appears in the ternary representation, it goes to this Q1, which is sort of a, a dead state. I didn't need to include Q1. I could have just had Q0 and then made Delta a partial function, but I chose to include it for illustrative purposes. Right, so, so, what does it mean if, if precisely the elements of the zero one interval with only zeros and twos in their ternary expansions are accepted? Uh, it means that this automaton recognizes uh, the Cantor set, the, the ternary Cantor set. And this brings us to regular omega languages. So regular omega languages are the subsets of sigma to omega. So this is just the, the usual set theoretic notation. We're looking at maps from the ordinal omega to our alphabet sigma, right? So, so strings of length omega um, where each, uh, each element of, of the, the sequence is in sigma. Uh, so these regular omega languages that are uh, those recognized by some Bucci automaton they can be written in terms of just regular languages, the ones I introduced before. And this is a, a well-known seminal theorem of Bucci from 62. So for every L uh, a omega language recognized by a Bucci automaton, there are regular languages. So these V sub i's and W sub i's, each of those are in sigma star, every element of each V sub i and each W sub i is finite length as a string. Uh, but, but so for the, for L a regular omega language, we can write it as a finite union of take V sub i and concatenate to on the right, W sub i to omega. So again, just write maps from omega to W sub i. Um, and this gives us a lot of control over these regular omega languages because we know that they're just finite unions of a regular language with an omega power. That's what I'm going to call wi to, to omega with an omega power of some regular language concatenated on the right. Right, so as an example. Actually, sorry, oh, just a yes. question. Sure. Um, so if you take uh, some element in uh, wi, 
mm -hmm. uh, to the omega, mm -hmm. you, you get an element. Uh, I mean, you get a word by concat concatenating uh, each word uh, within uh, wi into an infinite word. Or... Right. So, so wi to omega. There's like uh, it's a sequence indexed by omega where each for each n the the you know nth digit is a word from wi right um, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're asking or and so how do you get uh, an infinite word from um, of, of letters from from this oh so you're each, each element of WI is of finite length. Um, so maybe WI is all strings with exactly one one in them, maybe, maybe sigma is zero and one. And then you can have that, um, you know, uh, an element of WI to sigma might be, like it might be the case that each, each element in um, your sequences is getting longer and longer, but they'll always be finite length, right? So, so maybe it's like zero one followed by zero zero one is the second element of your sequence, and so on. And so you can you can have one of these omega powers where each like um, each element of W I is getting arbitrarily long. But okay, I guess my question is is uh, just just so let's let's say that a W is just um, contain just a word with two letters. Mm -hmm. So if you take um, w to the power omega, you will have sequences of just this word. Yeah. So so if w and is just one into... word, like a b, then there's one word in the omega power, and it's a b repeating forever. Okay. 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 Great. Thanks. Awesome. Um, right. And then and then I wanted to give another example, which is I'm going to use blackbird bold d to denote the restricted dyadic rationals. Um, so that's m over two to the n, where m is less than two to the n. And um, when sigma is, is uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to say Cantor set, right. So Cantor set is what you expect when uh, sigma is zero, one, two. Cantor set, um, there is no, no vi and w, there's only w1 and it's the, the uh, set of words zero and two. Versus for dyadic rationals, um, V1 is, uh, so sigma is zero, one, and V1 is um, the, the language generated by zero and one, and W1 is just uh, the language containing the word zero. And so the omega power would be the infinite string of all zeros. Right. So connections to first order logic. So there is this ternary predicate, uh, VR, which holds for an input x, u, k, precisely if u is r to the minus n for some nat uh, positive natural number n, and the nth digit of the base r representation of x is k, or a base r representation of x um, is k. And so we think of this VR as sort of telling us, you know, if you go out to the digit corresponding to you, here's what the coefficient is in base R. So uh, a theorem of Boigelow, Razar, and Wolper from 1998 says that if you take uh, a subset of the, the unit cube in n dimensions, um, this is R regular precisely if X is zero definable in the expansion of the real ordered additive group by this VR predicate. And so as a corollary, we get that, uh, they show that this, this structure with the VR predicate is decidable. So now I'm going to take that sparsity notion and generalize it to R sparse. So we say a set X is R sparse if it's recognized by the Bucci automaton A and the number of length and prefixes with an infinite prolongation that's accepted by A grows at most polynomialian n. So we went from a condition on words of length at most n to length and prefixes that have uh, an infinite prolongation that's in the language. So equivalently, X is a finite union 
uh, this is non-trivial and actually comes out of the work of, of uh, Jason Bell and Raheem Musa. X is a finite union of sets whose base R representations are of the form, you know, after the, the radix point, you have some word U1 and uh, the Kleene star of a word V1, and then so on until you have some word U sub D and some word VD to the power omega. So, so all of the words in an R sparse set are eventually periodic. But more than eventually periodic, they have one of finitely many eventual periodic tails. Right, and these u sub i and v sub i, these are just words in sigma star, finite words on, on sigma. So, right, so as some examples, um, here are some our sparse sets to the minus n, we can write as uh, it, on the alphabet zero one, as some number of zeros, of one, and then zeros forever. Similarly, um, in on the alphabet zero, one, two, in ternary, the set one minus three to the minus n is some number of twos followed by zeros forever eventually. Non-examples include those restricted dyadic rationals, right? Those the prefixes grow exponentially. And similarly with the, the ternary cantor set for sigma is zero, one, two, the prefixes also grow exponentially. So those are not R sparse for R is two or three. Yeah. Right, so this relates to a result of, of Lau's um, from 85. He showed that uh, the reals as an additive group with a predicate for two to the Z is decidable. And moreover, every unary set is a finite union of intervals and discrete sets. Um, more in particular, uh, D minimal. And so what uh, one of the things Jason and I show is that if you take X in zero one to the D in the, the D dimensional unit box, if X is R sparse and infinite, then the expansion of the real ordered additive group by a predicate for that set defines exactly the same sets as uh, the expansion of the additive group by R to the minus N. And so as a corollary, we, we get that uh, for R sparse um, subsets of zero, one to the D, the expansion by a predicate for that set is D minimal. So I'm going to skip the, I, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip the de definition of Hausdorff dimension and just, um, I guess, hope that those who understand will appreciate this uh, sort of final result. Um, so a non-trivial fact that we show is that for a closed R regular subset of zero one, it has positive Hausdorff dimension precisely if it's not R sparse. And so we'll call a C, C a subset of R a Cantor set if it's compact, has no isolated points and no interior. Um, so Hieronymi and Walsberg have shown that when you expand the real additive group by a predicate for a Cantor set, then you can actually interpret the monadic second order theory of the naturals. And that's bad, that, that if you know what IP and TP2 is, that structure has all of those bad model theoretic properties. Um, and so uh, what Jason and I show is that if X is a closed R regular subset of zero one, and the Hausdorff dimension is strictly between zero and one, then there is a unary set C definable in the expansion of the real ordered additive group by a predicate for X, such that this definable set C is a Cantor set. So that structure has all of the bad properties too. Um, and I was going to mention something else, but I'm out of time. So I'm just going to show my bibliography and say, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi.